Poštovani gledatelji, dobrodošli u Eurointervju. Zastupnici u Europskom parlamentu nisu zadovoljni proračunom koje su dogovorile zemlje članice. Kažu da tih 960 milijarda eura neće biti dovoljno za sedmogodišnji razvoj Unije i za poticanje zapošljavanja. Hoće li Europski parlament blokirati taj dogovor ili će se kompromis tražiti u drugačijem načinu trošenja tog novca i kako će u svemu tome financijski proći Hrvatska? Odgovore ćemo doznati od naših gostiju. U studiju Europskog parlamenta u Strasburu pozdravljam Alena Lamasura, predsjednika odbora Europskog parlamenta za proračun. Dobar dan, dobrodošli. Welcome, Mr. Lamasur. Dobar dan. S nama je i Jan Mulder, nizozemski zastupnik u Europskom parlamentu. Welcome to Eurointervju, Mr. Mulder. Dobar dan. Naš je gost i Ivajlo Kalfin, bugarski zastupnik u Europskom parlamentu. Welcome to Eurointervju, Mr. Kalfin. Dobar dan. S nama je i Andre Plenković, hrvatski promatrač u Europskom parlamentu. Dobrodošli u Eurointervju. Dobar dan, lijepi pozdrav svim gledateljima. Mr. Lamassur, Council President Van Rompuy has recently defended the agreement on the EU budget for 2014-2020 but he didn't manage to convince everyone. Does the agreement need to be renegotiated? At least part of it. Uh, a few days ago, the European Parliament has uh, responded publicly by a resolution uh, in uh, our plenary, um, and our response can be uh, summarized, no, unless, if. Because uh, we understand that against the current background, it's very difficult for, for the member states to raise the national contributions to finance the EU budget. But we cannot accept on the principle of a EU budget which would be condemned to uh, decrease uh, for the next seven years. So we are ready to negotiate but uh, f on a different basis, with a different distribution of monies uh, between uh, the various um, uh, policies, EU policies, and under the condition that we obtain a midterm revision, uh, seven years is too long time uh, now, and under the condition that we start Uh, changing the uh, system uh, whereby the EU is financed uh, from national contributions to a different system of own resources directly allocated to the EU budget and then alleviating uh, the uh, burden uh, for the national budget. Mr. Mulder, Uh, the proposed budget was rejected by the largest political group. So where do you see a room for maneuver? I think there is a room for maneuver in the sense that the parliament has expressed a number of wishes for the budget in past resolutions. And they especially concern flexibility. We want to have more movement between the chapters than is possible at the moment. So that is something we will ask for. I think we also are interested in having ultimately a new system of own resources. The prison system, where it is main, the money is mainly coming straight from the budget of the member state, that is not satisfactory as we are making commitments and then we discover in the end that we are unable to pay for it. So the, the key word I think is flexibility. Mr. Kalfin, uh, you have uh, two opportunities to say no. Uh, within a few days, that means after the first vote and possibly in a several months' time for the final version of the agreement. How should the European Parliament handle this budget issue? Uh, we have just one opportunity to say yes or no, and this is uh, the procedure. And in order to, uh, to, to, to find a compromise and to have a yes, we need to negotiate with the Council, because uh, the agreement which has been reached uh, by the members of the Council uh, takes maybe into consideration the, some national considerations, but not the European uh, priorities. And there is a huge discrepancy between European political priorities and budget and fiscal instruments that are on the table. So before saying yes or no, in order to say yes, we would like to explore all the possibilities with the Council uh, to get to an agreement which is bringing the financial resources in line with the political commitments of the Union.
Uh, Mr. Plankovic, uh, what would be the best solution to reduce the objectives, to increase the budget or to implement it better? Well, you have seen that given the very uh, tough economic situation in the whole of the European Union, the heads of state and government have opted for a serious decrease in total amounts of the budget, both in commitments and payments for the next seven years. So it is very difficult after that agreement in February to expect that there would be a substantial change. I think that the points which the Parliament has made, and that is in particular about the revision of the MFF in a few years' time, the roadmap for own resources system, and also greater flexibility, are key for looking at the budget in a positive sense, because we believe that this budget should be a budget for growth and for, um, I would say, improving of the economic situation in all the member states, including Croatia, because there are big expectations of our membership. And therefore, the flexibility is the key word at this stage of the negotiations. Uh, Mr. Lamassoure, would that uh, flexible <coughs> mechanism allow unspent funds uh, to be uh, put in uh, different areas or to be transferred from year to year? Uh, both, actually. Uh, a lesson we must all draw from all what has happened uh, for the last uh, three or four years is that we need more flexibility. We need more flexibility. Uh, in all our member states, our budget policies has changed three times for the last seven years. And now the order of the day is to cut, cut, cut. But we are on the verge of uh, a, a, a recession all over Europe possibly in two or three years' time, the order of the day will be different. That, that means we need flexibility. But there is one point I want to make before uh, uh, a Croatian audience, is that whatever happens on this negotiation, the figures, the appropriations for Croatia are not questioned by anybody, be it in the Council, in Commission, or in the Parliament. We will make sure that the amounts uh, promised to Croatia uh, will be uh, decided uh, in the end. But Mr. Coffin, in the worst case scenario, what will happen if there is no agreement? Hopefully we are going to be able to avoid the worst case scenario. Uh, but uh, if there is no agreement, uh, there are provisions. I mean, you don't have a disaster, disorder, you don't have a chaos afterwards. Uh, you have a provisions of the, of the Lisbon Treaty, which means that the budget levels of this year, which is 2013, are going to continue until we find an agreement uh, uh, with the Council. Uh, <coughs> of course, there are a number of regulations, directives, etc., etc., that have to be extended if this is not the case. But uh, I really think that, uh, again, the worst case scenario, if we cannot find a good compromise with the Council, uh, we are going to find a way uh, uh, to give the possibility to the European Union to continue functioning. But this is not a good solution. The good solution is to have the long-term perspective and the security in the member states, what is the financing and what are the priorities. Mr. Mulder, do you expect that the Parliament will say yes by the end of June, namely before Croatia enters the EU? I can only say something about uh, past experiences. Seven years ago, the compromise reached in the Council was rejected by the Parliament, and in May we had a result. Seven years before that, again the compromise was rejected by the Parliament, and in a couple of months we had an agreement. So history never repeats itself, but there is a possibility that we have an agreement before July. Uh, Mr. Plankovic, we have heard that uh, Parliament is supporting the part of the agreement regarding the funds for Croatia. In the next budget period, 2014-2020, uh, Croatia would be able to draw up to 11.7 billion euro. Is that enough? Well, certainly it is much more than we got in the pre-accession period. You are aware, and the Croatian public as well, that we more or less during the last 10, 12 years had available around 150 million euros. And this, in this situation, we are having virtually 10 times more money to spend in the course of next seven years. I believe that the funds allocated for Croatia, and I was happy that Mr. Lamassur, when he was in Zagreb quite uh, some few weeks ago, actually insisted on that, that the funds for Croatia will remain as they are today. That 
that is 11.7, around 8 billion uh, euros for cohesion is a big challenge for all the Croatian institutions and therefore I welcome the recent paper by the Commission which has signaled to all the Croatian institutions how the Commission based on the experience of our IPA assistance and based on the experience of other countries who have recently joined the European Union should focus on priorities in absorbing the funds which are available. And therefore now it is up to the Croatian institutions to follow on on the good work we had with the National Strategic Reference Framework document in the last couple of years to highlight the priorities and to really absorb the funds in the best possible manner. Uh, Mr. Kalfin, over the period 2007-2013, if I'm not wrong, Bulgaria was allocated 7 billion euro in cohesion and structural funds. What benefit it brings to Bulgaria? Oh, it brings a huge benefit to Bulgaria because the European money practically generates additional investments. You have the national co-financing, you have private co-investments, so practically this money is multiplied uh, by, by, by a factor, factor of uh, three or four uh, in terms of real investments in the economy. And you have some very visible, uh, visible results. Uh, you have uh, infrastructure, you have roads, uh, you have possibilities for small and medium-sized enterprises to work better. Uh, you have uh, uh, infrastructure in the environment sector, including water uh, processing, uh, uh, waste uh, management, etc., etc. And this is visible where people live in the towns, in the in the uh, in their villages, and uh, and this is what Europe brings to Bulgaria. That's that's very very visible. But Mr. Mulder, Bulgaria has absorption rate of, I think, 19%, which is, I think, the lowest rate in the EU. Well, Bulgaria has a, such a poor track record in absorption, and what uh, absorption rate do you expect for Croatia? I think uh, the rules underlying the spending of money are complicated, and it might take some time before a country completely uh, comprehends the situation. I think 19% is low. I cannot give you a forecast for Croatia because I don't know the country well enough, but I think uh, the government should be advised that they have to uh, understand the rules because if you understand the rules, it is easier to spend the money and not to be corrected afterwards by the Commission. Uh, Mr. Lamassoure, you have been briefed recently by Zagreb with the Croatian officials regarding those uh, fund allocation and absorption rate. What do you expect from Croatian side in that respect? Well, I am optimistic. I have met uh, um, some important uh, um, members of the Croatian uh, government and parliament and I was very struck by the level of preparation of all the uh, political leaders and uh, administrative uh, uh, officials uh, from Croatia. Uh, you, you must uh, realize that even in a country like France, my country, it took us uh, a lot of years before uh, getting, reaching an absorption rate uh, relatively satisfactory. But this cohesion policy was particularly effective even for uh, a, a country like France. In my, my region, my constituency, the southwest of France, region of Bordeaux and Toulouse. So it took us 15 or 20 years before catching up with the uh, average uh, region of France. And now we are above the average due to the funds coming from Brussels. It took us some time to use better these funds and hopefully, uh, drawing the lessons from our experience, a country like Croatia will be able uh, also to catch up the average uh, of the EU. Average, I think, in the EU is about 33 percent. Uh, Mr. Plenkovic, uh, uh, Croatia is going to be able to withdraw such billion of euros and uh, Croatia is going to be net beneficiary of the EU funds. Uh, but how can you be certain that the money will go to the right projects? Well, that is up to the government to, to pick up the right priorities. And I think that we have learned over the past 10 years the, the basic functioning of the spending system of the European Union funds. And that's why I mentioned the National Strategic Reference Framework as a document who set out priorities both in terms of competitiveness, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of transport. These are the lines that the current government is following up on the work of the previous government. And therefore, we should always 
always look to the added value of the European funds to the national priorities that the government has as its own development framework. This is the key in order to find synergy between the European priorities and the funds available and the national activities. This is really essential. Uh, Mr. Kalfin, from your experience <coughs> in uh, Bulgaria, how that absorption rate might be boosted? Uh, with experience. <laughs> Uh, indeed, I mean, uh, I, if I might uh, correct a little bit uh, your figure, uh, Bulgaria's absorption rate is 27% at this moment, and we have uh, committed 97-98% uh, of the contract. So let's see in the next uh, two years until the end of the spending period how much is going to be absorbed. Uh, but this is a very good example because at the beginning of the period, switching from pre-accession funds uh, to cohesion funds, uh, it's not automatic. And I think that we learned this lesson in Bulgaria. I mean, you don't, you don't just uh, wake up next day and continue the same way. You have much more money, you have different uh, requirements. In the new financial framework, there will be additional requirements about the results, about the impact. And every country will have to sign uh, an agreement with the European Commission. So uh, there is a change. Uh, the administration has to be very much prepared. One of the problems in Bulgaria was that decision making was very much concentrated uh, at a higher level. So it has to be decentralized the decision-making process, the work of the whole administration has to work, and I'm sure that Croatia is going to manage with that. I mean, this is uh, coming with the experience, and uh, with few years' experience, I'm, uh, I'm very optimistic. And a final question to each of you. Uh, are you committed that and convinced that Croatia will fulfill all the obligations, that uh, the Commission's latest report, monitoring report, will be positive one, and the remaining member states are going to be able to ratify the accession treaty in time, Mr. Mulder? I voted myself in favor of the accession of Croatia, and therefore I am an optimist. And I have full confidence in Croatia that it will fulfill the conditions in the future. I would be disappointed if it wouldn't be the case. Mr. Kalfin, your position on the issue of uh, Croatia's section on the 1st of uh, July? Um, I think that uh, there is no obstacle that it happens on the 1st of, uh, of July. The few remaining uh, ratifications, as far as I, I understand, uh, do not uh, pose any problem. I, I hope that soon in neighboring Slovenia there will be a government and a parliament also, but. Uh, I understand that there is no more problem, which is an obstacle, which is for the ratification. So we are looking forward uh, to, to welcome uh, Croatia on the 1st of July. Mr. Plenkovic, what are the latest your information regarding the concept and the substance of the Commission's monitoring report? Well, according to my information, the Commission will come up with a positive assessment of the so-called 10 deliverables, which were earmarked in uh, the report of October, and we look really for a swift completion of ratification in all the member states. The key element was that uh, a solution was found to overcome the problem of Ljubljanska Banka with Slovenia, and if the Slovenian Parliament swiftly ratifies, then I think that the road is opened, and we are all actually looking forward to have a lot of European debate in the Croatian public because we have the forthcoming European Parliament's first ad hoc elections on the 14th of April. And Mr. Lamassur, have you been able to see possibly the draft report of monitoring for Croatia? Uh, I, have, I have had an exchange of views with President Barroso himself and I am very optimistic on the content. And uh, uh, the four uh, of us are, are members of the Budgets Committee of the Parliament. Uh, in the next few weeks and possibly days, we will have to examine an amending budget for the year 2013 entirely dedicated to, to Croatia, in favor of Croatia. I am, and I am sure that uh, uh, it will be passed uh, by a unanimous vote in the Budgets Committee and uh, hopefully in the plenary of the European Parliament. Dear guests, uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much indeed. Cijenjene gledateljice i gledatelji, pratili ste Euro in